The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Today we're going to continue uh, discussing firm behavior uh, but today we're going to uh, deviate from uh, our fantasy land of 1401 to come to the real world a little bit, uh, which is to talk a bit about whether firms actually maximize profits. Um, the whole uh, presumption of uh, producer theory is just as we think with consumer theory, consumers maximize utility, it's the producers maximize profits. That turns out to be an incredibly useful shorthand for lots of things and will turn out to be, uh, as with any simplifying assumption, largely right and largely will help us uh, draw a lot of interesting conclusions about firms and markets. Nonetheless, it's clearly not right in reality for every firm. Um, for example, um, we see lots of firms doing things which look pretty wasteful, like big corporate jets or other things like that. Uh, more relevantly, uh, huge pay for CEOs seems pretty wasteful. So for example, uh, in 2004, the net income of Eli Lilly, the drug manufacturer, fell by 29%, yet the CEO got a 41% raise to $12.5 million a year. Um, or even more so in the financial crisis, in 2009, Citigroup and Merrill each lost more than $27 billion. Pretty bad year for the financial sector, you might think. And yet their CEO's pay in each company rose by more than 10% to about $15 million. So in the worst year for the financial system since 1929, uh, the CEO pay increased in these two companies. So you might think that, gee, this sounds kind of off. How could we explain that? Well, there's two possible explanations. So one explanation is that things which look wasteful really aren't. That is that we pay CEOs a huge amount of money, but they're worth it. Uh, so for example, even at his ultimate salary of $33 million per year, Michael Jordan was vastly underpaid. By any reasonable economic analysis of the value he added to the Chicago Bulls, it was well in excess of $50 million. So even though he's paid $33 million, Michael Jordan was underpaid. Um, similarly, just because someone gets paid a lot of money doesn't mean that they're overpaid. These CEOs are very talented people and may be underpaid. Now this is an argument you might have made with a somewhat straight face maybe 10 or 15 years ago. It's hard to make that with a straight face now. It's hard to believe that these CEOs, these companies, uh, aren't overpaid given their company performance and given the kind of facts we just talked about. Um, so a better explanation for things like excessive CEO pay is something which we call the um, agency problem. The agency problem. Okay, And that's what I want to emphasize in today's lecture is that in reality, um, we think of a firm as something where there's a guy who's an owner. He hires some machines and some workers. They make stuff that he thought of. And uh, you produce it and some profits made. Okay. So the model we have in mind when we talked about the firm so far in this course is the model of what we might call a sole proprietorship or a partnership. A model where one individual, where there's basically a commonality. The key thing that we've discussed so far is a commonality of interest between the owners who own the company okay, and the control of production. So the people who earn the money from the company also control the production. So when you start your startups when you graduate, okay, you will start them as a sole proprietorship or a partnership where you own the company and you control what's done. Okay, you're there 18 hours a day making sure the guy's doing what they're supposed to do uh, and you're the one who gets the money if they succeed or lose the money if they fail. Okay? And that's the model we've had in mind. We've thought about corporations or, or firms so far in our class. But in fact, most production in the US doesn't happen that way. Most production in the US happens through the guise of corporations. Okay? Corporations are marked by a separation of ownership and control. What defines a corporation is a separation of ownership and control. The owners of corporations are the stockholders, or what we call the equity holders. P 
people who have invested money in the corporation. So the owners of the corporation are its investors, its stockholders, its equity holders. Okay? All of you, most of you, probably somewhere, you know, if you're Jewish, it's in some bar mitzvah gift you got. If you're not, it's in some other gift you got. Probably have some equity ownership in something somewhere. Okay? You maybe have a little bond which says you own five shares of GM that someone gave you because I thought it'd be cute or whatever. Okay, that's not worthless, but maybe some other company. Okay? Um, and we're equity holders. We invest in companies. But we don't make the production decision. The production decision is made by the firm's managers who are employees of the, the owners, the equity holders. Okay? So now these managers may have some ownership. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But by and large, the primary ownership of the firm is done by people who do not control the everyday decisions of production. And it sort of makes sense it has to be that way. When a company's as big as Microsoft, okay, you couldn't have me somewhere. I'm sure if you add up my, in my, out of my various stock funds I own, I own a 0.0000001% of Microsoft. Okay? You, it'd be crazy to have me involved with a 0.0001% of the decision making. I don't know anything about anything that Microsoft does. Okay? It makes sense that there's a separation of ownership and control once companies get big enough. But the fact that there is a separation of ownership and control can lead to this agency problem and can lead to firms not maximizing profits. Okay? So basically, the point is that managers care not just about the profits they make, but also how happy their life is. And things which make their life happy may be things which aren't profit maximizing. The managers who are in charge of production may have their own agenda that deviates from profit maximization. And the problem is, it may be hard to figure that out if you're the owner of the firm. So the agency problem is the first example of a problem we'll talk about later in the semester of imperfect information. This is the first time we'll see imperfect information. We've assumed in our class so far, and we'll assume in our class going forward, that there's perfect information in the world, that everyone knows what stuff costs, that everyone can shop costlessly across providers, et cetera. But in fact, the world is marked by imperfect information. Okay? The, as an owner of Microsoft, as a you know, trivial owner of Microsoft, I don't know for sure that every Microsoft employee is doing what's profit maximizing for the company. I can't. Okay? It's just impossible for me to own that. So that creates an agency problem. And the agency problem arises because it's in the employee's interest to perhaps do things which aren't profit maximizing. So as a simple example, imagine that you're an investor in a company uh, that's a medium-sized company, and the head of that company is jealous because all his friends at bigger companies have their own jets, and he's got to fly commercial. He says, I want my own jet because I'm not cool enough. There's this great thing, okay, uh, there's this great episode of The Simpsons where um, Burns goes to the billionaire's club, and he's in the Millionaire's Club, and then eventually his wealth drops for Pelosi, so gets thrown to the Millionaire's Club, and it's these yokels in the Millionaire's Club. He's like, I want to be back in the Billionaire's Club. Okay? The point is, managers of companies care about how they look and who they hang out with, and you've got this manager of a medium-sized company who wants his own private jet, but he knows that that's not profit maximizing. Because he knows that if he figures out all his travel and prices it out at competitive prices, it would be cheaper to just travel commercial. So what does he do? He puts together a glossy PowerPoint, which he presents, to, the, to you, the owner of the company, showing that financially it would be more prudent to own a jet than to fly commercial. What he doesn't point out in putting together that PowerPoint is in putting together the commercial prices he used, he chose the highest rates from flying from point A to point B, not the lowest rates. Now, unless you're an expert on the cost of flying from point A to point B, you won't know that. You'll say, well, that's a pretty impressive presentation. Yes, you can show us you've saved 20% by having your own plane. Go get it. But it turned out he didn't save 20%. He just cooked the numbers in a way to make his life nicer, even if it wasn't profit maximizing. And it's impossible. That's an example of the kind of problem that arises with imperfect information. Okay. Now, and I could you go through examples all the time, but I, th I don't think you need. I think you guys probably all understand what I'm talking about, which is there's lots of ways employees of companies might make their lives nicer that aren't profit maximizing. Now, corporations have recognized this from time immemorial, and they've recognized that their owners are too diffuse to monitor this. So what corporations do is they have set up an intermediary, uh, intermediary between the owners and the producers called a board of directors.
The board of directors is a set of individuals appointed by the owners that are supposed to actually pay attention to what's going on in production. The owners say, look, we can't afford to pay, to pay attention, but we're going to appoint you, the board of directors, are going to pay you quite a lot of money. A typical director on a Fortune 500 company will make 100000 plus a year. Okay, it's a part-time job. Okay, we appointed you to keep an eye on the tools of production. The problem is the board of directors aren't that good at it either because it turns out to be really hard to figure out exactly what's going on. So for example, and this is made worse because the members of the board of directors are often chosen by management of the company, by the people running the production, not by the owners. So they'll, they'll make selections of who's going to be on the board of directors and they'll pack it with their friends who will be nice to them. So for example, Richard Grasso was the uh, CEO of the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, he started out in like the mailroom, worked his way up, became CEO of the New York Stock Exchange, and retired with a $187 million severance package, which was outrageous and totally unearned. Okay? But the board of directors was a bunch of his buddies who'd known him since he was a kid, and they said, he seems like a nice guy, let's give him a bunch of money. Okay? And a lot of the board directors, when actually grilled on it, didn't actually know he'd gotten that much. They were like, wow, we hadn't realized his retirement package was that big. So it turns out board of, having the board of directors does not solve the agency problem because there's still too much of an information of perfection between the managers and the board of directors, not to mention the managers and the owners. Okay, so what do we do? What do we do with this agency problem? Well, this was known for a lot of years, okay? And about 25 years ago, the thinking was, look, we, the way to solve this problem is we need to align the incentives of the managers and the owners. If we're going to solve this problem, we need to get the managers, the producers, to actually care about maximizing profits enough that they'll do that even if it makes their life a little uncomfortable. And how do we do that? We turn the managers into owners. We give the managers, the producers, an ownership stake in the company. We say, look, you now are going to be directly, your income's going to be directly derived from the profitability of this company. So now you'll have a direct incentive to do what's profit maximizing even if it makes your life a little uncomfortable. Even if it means flying commercial, you'll recognize, gee, if I fly corporate and lower the company's profits, then I'm going to suffer. If I have my own jet, then I'm going to suffer. So we want to align the incentives. So we want to give them an ownership stake in the company. Well, how do you do that? How do you give managers an ownership stake? Well, there's two ways you can do it. One way is you can directly give them stock. So you can directly say, look, instead of paying you in cash, we're going to pay you in company stock. So your fortunes will di di directly be tied to the performance of this company. You pay them in stock, or alternatively, you can do something which turns out to be cheaper, which you can give them stock options. Turns out to be cheaper, at least in principle. We can give them stock options. So let's talk about what a stock option is, since some of you may deal with these along the way. Okay? The stock, a, a stock is a piece of paper which says you own 0.001% of the company. A stock option is simply a piece of paper which says, we are granting you the right to buy the stock at some price. Typically, it's today's price. So we're saying we're not giving you a share of the company. We have a piece of paper which says if the value of the stock today is 100, we have a piece of paper which says no matter where the stock ends up, you can always buy it for 100. Why is that valuable? Well, that's valuable because let's say you give a CEO of a company a million shares, a, a million options at $100 each when the price of the stock is 100. Well, if the price of the stock rises to 150, that CEO can then take his million options, say, I want to buy the shares for 100, which I'm allowed to buy these pieces of paper, and I'll turn around and sell them for 150. I've just made $50 million. So a stock option is valuable if the stock goes up, but it's worthless if the stock goes down. So it's kind of the ultimate incentive, if you think about it, because what it says is to the CEO, look, we're going to incent you to do better. And you make a lot of money by doing better, but, you, but, you, but if you do worse, you're not going to get anything. And as myself, as the owner, it seems great because it's cheaper, right? Because if the stock goes up, I share some with the guy, but I don't care. I'm happy the stock goes up. If it goes down, I don't have to give him anything. And in fact, giving someone a stock option costs effectively about half as much as giving them stock. So if I say today's stock price, if I, instead of giving you a share of stock, I give you an option to buy a share of stock at today's price, the value to that, what it cost me in the market, is about half of what it cost me to actually give you the share of stock. So it seems like the best deal. You get all the incentives for them to raise the price, but it costs you half as much. And in fact, um, there's been tremendous growth in use of stock and stock options. So if you look at figure 12.1, figure 12.1, now this sort of changes. Before 1992, 
there's only two categories. And after 92, there's three. So 492, it just is divided into salary, salary uh, and bonus uh, versus options. So you see there were essentially no options in 84. OK, the mean, this is the mean CEO pay. So the typical CEO in 1994 made $500,000, and it was all cash, all salary and bonus. By 1992, they made about a million bucks, and, and a decent share of it started to be stock options. Now, starting after 92, we actually break into three categories, which is salary, bonus, and options. Okay, but that doesn't really matter. The main thing is to pay attention to the option share, which you see grew astronomically. And so by its peak in about 2002, much more than half, first of all, a typical CEO was making $3.5 million. $3 million. Okay? Second of all, the majority of that was in stock options. So basically, in fact, if you look at salary and bonus, it didn't grow that much over time. Okay? Uh, if you look at you know, 1992 versus 2002, over that decade, salary and bonus barely grew. Okay, but options went through the roof. So well, there's a huge increase in use of these. And the motivation is pretty basic economic intuition, which is what we're going to do is this is a cheap way to align the incentives of owners and managers. Okay? And that was why they took off, and everyone thought it was great. And people like Michael Jensen, Harvard Business School, made fortunes off having suggested this, et cetera. It was like we solved the problem. And remember, we did pretty damn well in the 1990s. Okay? And a lot of it, people attributed it to exactly what's in this graph. That by finally figuring out how to align the incentives of producers and owners, we, we figured out a way to change the economy. And we'd sort of, people thought we sort of entered this new, economy, new economic era of mass, massive productivity. Okay. Well, people, as we know now, were wrong. Okay? Things slowed down in the 2000s and then now have completely crashed. Okay? And why were they wrong? Well, they're wrong because what makes economics fun is unintended consequences. And these stock options had two kinds of unintended consequences. Okay? The first unintended consequence is that they lead to excessive gambling. Excessive gambling. Okay? And what I mean by that is that once your stock option is out of the money, once if you got it for 100, you're below 100, you don't care how low it goes. Right? If you're, not, if you're at 99 or 20, you don't care. All you care about is being 100 versus above. What that means is you're going to take, ex as an owner, as a manager, you'll take excessive risks to go into the positive territory. Even if there's a huge risk, you'll get nailed on the downside. OK? So now contrast um, two guys working for a company that's currently worth $100. One is given stock, and one is given stock options at $100. OK? Now, and for ima imagine they're both going to leave the company in one year to make this because you know, there's dynamics of long run issues. Let's put that aside. They're both going to leave in one year. One today is given a share of stock, and one today is given an option to buy at 100 and then they're given a choice of a risky, a chance of a risky investment. Someone comes to them and says, have I got a deal for you? I've got an investment that has a 10% chance that it will double the value of your company. And a 90% chance the value of your company will fall by 20%. 10% chance. So there's a 10% chance of a 100% return. 10% chance of a 100% return. And a 90% chance of a 20% decline in your company's value. Now, what is the profit maximizing thing to do in this situation? Well, to do that, we have to consider the concept of what delivers the company the highest expected value. Expected value is a concept we'll use, and we'll come back to this later when we talk about uncertainty. It's a concept we use to measure how you value things when there's uncertainty. So the expected value of a gamble is the probability that you win times the value if you win plus the probability that you lose times the value if you lose. That's the expected value of a gamble. Okay? And the profit maximizing thing to do would be to take gambles that have expected values of greater than 0. Okay? The expected value is the, the a summation of the value of that gamble. This gamble has an expected value of 0 0.1 times 100, 100% return with 10% chance, 
plus 0 0.9 times negative 20, a 90% chance of losing 20, or an expected value of minus 8%. That is, if you take this gamble and you took it an infinite number of times, you would end up losing 8% on average. Okay? I mean, any one time it might work out. But by the law of large numbers, if we took this enough times, you'd lose 8% on average. Okay? So you will lower the value of your company. You will reduce profits by taking this gamble. Your company's worse off if you take this gamble. Well, what would the person who got the $100 in stock do? They won't take the gamble. Because their $100 in stock will be worth, on average, 8% less if they take this gamble. So say, I'm not taking the gamble. This is stupid. But now let's look at the guy who got the option. His gamble's a little bit different. Because he doesn't care whether the value of the company is 99 or 80. He just cares about how much it goes above 100. So what is his calculation? Well, his calculation is he has a 10% chance of making 100% and a 90% chance of what? Zero. Ended up with zero. Because he, he, he can't lose. OK, it's a 90% chance of zero. So what is his calculation? Well, he has views this as a positive 10% gamble. He makes money on this gamble. Because heads, he wins. Tails, he walks away. The guy who owns the stock loses if it's tails with this weighted coin that only hits tails, heads 10% heads of the time. This guy only wins. So he says, sure, any gamble which has huge upside, I'm going to take because I get all the upside and I don't bear the downside. Okay. So what this does is it leads to excessive gambling, excessive risk taking. And that's exactly what we saw in our economy, was companies gambling on things which sounded very good, managers gambling on things which sounded very good, some of which worked out very well, and some of which didn't. Okay? And that's the first problem we have with the use of stock options. Okay, questions about that? Okay, this, yeah? Certainly are more sophisticated ways you can do that. I mean, there are certainly more sophisticated ways you can do that. But that's a great segue to the second problem with these, which is the second problem is who decided the structure of the stock options? The managers. So the managers had executive compensation committees that designed the stock options the managers got. So the second problem was there was just outright cheating. So what you just described would be a great structure, which would incentivize them excellently, but would not make them the most money. So the second problem we had was outright cheating. So there's a wonderful investigation by the Wall Street Journal that investigated a whole host of stock option arrangements. And what they found was companies would frequently do what's called backdating stock options. What they'd say is, look, the value of the company just went up from 100 to 150 last week. Okay, we're going to give you an option at 100. And let's pretend it was issued before the company value went up. We've just given you money, right? You haven't, you haven't done anything to earn that. We've just given you money. And the Wall Street Journal found incredible evidence of, backdate, of, of uh, backdating stock options. So they had one CEO that got sick. They found he had six. New, yeah, I'm sorry. So like, is the company paying the money, or I thought it's like the market? The owners are paying the money. The owners. Because basically what happened, no. People who are buying this stock that you guys are selling the option to? No, no, no. But here's the thing. When I gave it to you, then basically I gave you something of value. I have to pay for that thing of value. Now, ultimately, the transaction happens in the market. But basically, in other words, I, let, I give you this option to buy the stock at 100. This is an important point that wasn't clear enough on. I give you this option to buy a stock at 100. The stock's now worth 150. That means that stock I, I could have had at 150 as an owner and worth 150. But by letting you buy, take it at 100, Okay, I let you keep the extra fifty dollars instead of me getting it. I have a share of stock which, as an owner, is worth one hundred and fifty. Okay, I've essentially given that. I've given that to you. Okay, I've essentially transferred to you one hundred and fifty dollars. So when companies do, yeah, exactly. You know, the, the, they'll keep some amount of shares. The owners themselves have the, the owners basically, basically the owners. They will sell stock and they'll do offerings, but the owners own the majority of the stock. That's what makes them the owners. Maybe that's the right way to put it. Yeah. Right. Uh, no. Well, in principle, the board of directions of directors approves stocks. They don't decide. An executive management committee decides. 
The executive management can consist of all the golf buddies of the CEO. They decide. The board of directors is supposed to make sure nothing untoward happens. The board of directors, they're just a bunch of you know, retired former executives who are also golf buddies to the manager. So they don't really get it right. Okay. So there's outright cheating. So for instance, one CEO, he got six so stock options. Okay. Each one happened to be issued happened to be issued the day before, at least on paper, was issued the day before a huge increase in the stock price. Now, the CEO said he was just lucky. Okay, but the Wall Street Journal did a simulation and calculated there was a one in a billion chance he could have been that lucky. That in fact, what clearly happened was he got the stock options a week later and they were backdated to make it seem like he got them before the price went up. But that's not, but that's not the best example. The best example is Cablevision. They granted and backdated options to their vice chairman from 1997 to 2002. So from 1997 to 2002, they gave them options and they kept backdating them to make them look good. Okay? The only problem was he died in 1999. So basically, they were just giving money away to this guy's heirs. Clearly, they weren't incentivizing his performance. As the quote said, trying to incentivize a corpse suggests they were not complying with the spirit of stock shareholder approved stock option plans. Okay? They were just giving money to his heirs because they felt bad for him because they weren't keeping their yacht up or whatever. Okay? So basically, this is an example of the kind of cheating. Of course, then you can go further and there's outright fraud. Okay? The backdating is sort of cheating. You can go even further. I don't know what determines fraud versus cheating. But basically, um, you can just do what Enron did. What Enron did is the executives there just lied about how much money they were making. They just went public with figures that were wrong. The stock price went up. They cashed in their options and quit. Okay? And as long as you don't get caught, that's a great deal. And if you do get caught, well, you know, they fine you for a third of what you made. So who cares? So basically, there's outright fraud. And this was a lot of what happened. A lot of the wealth that we thought was created in the 1990s in the stock market was really just false wealth created by people saying their companies were worth more than they actually were. Yeah? Um, no. Basically, I mean, once again, it varies by company to company. But basically, the dividend payout would be something that a different set of managers would decide, once again, subject to the approval of the owners. But once again, the point is that the owners of a company, of a big company, are just a few set of people who don't know what they're doing. Okay? The managers know exactly what they're doing. The board of directors is in between and is half clueless, half knows what it's doing. And that's at least the agency problem. And so basically, what's sort of interesting about this example is it sort of points out, like in many things in economics, why we're called the dismal science. Okay, there is no right answer here. Okay? On the one hand, if you don't incentivize your owners, then they might not do what's profit maximizing. On the other hand, if you incentivize your owners, they might do cheating to maximize their profits as opposed to the company's profits. And that's why you need complicated structures, the type that suggest in the back. And that's why, for example, they find the companies with much more concentrated ownership, you know, the ones that Warren Buffett owns 20% of, they do a much better job in their CEO compensation than the ones where it's just a bunch of people owning a tiny, tiny percent. Um, so that's exactly the kind, of, um, the kind of difficulty you face in setting up executive compensation. Now, this, is just, this was a real sort of departure from the kind of things we've talked about. Just one example. This is really partly what we want to do in this course. We want to teach about basic economics. Partly we want to excite you about what else you can go on and do in economics. Okay? I've just, what I've just done the last half hour is a microcosm of the field of corporate finance. Okay? There's an entire field of economics called corporate finance. We teach it in course 15. And the terrific courses, 15401 and 15402, are the introductory courses. And if you find this stuff exciting, as I'm saying some of you are, that's a great place to take what we're learning this course and go on and actually dive in, realize that half the stuff I've told you I'm talking my ass, I don't really know for sure. But those guys do okay, in course 15. And you can really under, un, get into these agency relationships and understand how corporations work and how you set up these kinds of compensation arrangements. Um, so this is kind of just a very exciting area. It does. Now we're going to go back after this and assume corporations maximize profits again. And once again, as with any assumption we make, by and large it's right, and by and large it will deliver the kind of important knowledge that we know about how firms function. But it's important to remember that these kinds of things are behind it. What we do in this course is teach you the basics. Then you go on in these other electives and actually learn about these kind of more interesting tweaks than what we do here. Okay? Any other questions about this before I move on? OK. Now we're going to stop with, uh, with that topic. And we're going to move to sort of a, it's, it's kind, of a, kind of an in-between topic. That is, we've been talking about firms and firm profit maximization. 
And we talked about how that depends on the structure of the market in perfect competition. Starting in two lectures, we're going to start talking about alternative market structures like monopoly and oligopoly. But in order to talk about them, we need to introduce a new concept we haven't used before. And that's what we'll do the rest of this lecture and next lecture, which is we need to move from positive economics to normative economics. From positive economics to normative. Positive analysis is the study of the way things are. So the positive analysis is explaining why do firms produce this many widgets? Why do they hire this many workers? Why did I buy this many CDs? That's a positive analysis, trying to explain the way things are. That's what we've done by and large so far. Normative analysis is the analysis of the way things should be. Is it good that I bought that many CDs? Is it good that the company made that much profits? Would it be better? if we have a minimum wage or don't have a minimum wage. Normative analysis is the analysis of the way things should be as opposed to the way they are. Okay? So for example, we showed in the last lecture that in the long run, with free entry and exit, all firms are driven to zero profit and the supply curve is horizontal. Well, is that a good thing? We don't know. We just said it happened. I described why it happened, but I didn't tell you it was a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, zero profits. I make a lot of money off the profits the companies I own make. OK, I don't know, I don't know if I want a world with zero profits. OK, I got a lot of stock and stuff, and I'm making money because these companies make profits. I don't think I'd be that happy in a world with zero profits. How do we think about whether that's a good world or a bad world? How do we think about whether we like these outcomes or don't like them? This is, these are the tools of normative economics, or what we, what we refer to as welfare economics. Now, let me be clear here. The term welfare, as you might have heard it often, refers to money you give to low-income populations. And we'll talk about that kind of welfare later in the semester. Here, when I say welfare, I mean well-being. Welfare is, is the term economists use as a measure of well-being. Okay? We need to start talking about welfare economics, measuring the impact of economic outcomes on well-being. Not just studying what happens when firms maximize profits or consumers maximize utility, but measuring how we feel about it. Measuring whether it's good or bad, and measuring whether some outcomes might be preferred to others. Because if we don't do that, we can't ever talk about the role of the government in the economy. Until you start talking about welfare, you can't talk about whether we should have government interventions or not. Okay, you can only talk about what happens, not whether it should happen. Now, the problem with welfare economics is that it's a lot harder because of something I mentioned when we talked about utility which is that utility is an ordinal concept, not a cardinal concept. Okay? Utility is an ordinal concept, not a cardinal concept. That is, utils are meaningless. Okay? We use utility functions to decide whether you prefer package A or package B. But the actual amount of utils you get, unlike profits, is sort of a meaningless concept. It's just sort of, a, it's just sort of an index. Okay? So what we do to do welfare economics is we turn from utils to dollars. We measure welfare in dollars which is easy on the corporate side, that's profits. How do we do it on the consumer side? We do it through the concept that we call compensating variation, which is one of these things where economists use fancy terms for something which isn't that hard to understand. Okay, But you need to know the fancy terms because that's kind of how we teach. Compensating variation. That is, instead of asking, how sad are you about outcome x? We ask, how many dollars would it take? How many dollars, instead of asking how sad would you be to not have a CD, we ask, how much would you pay to avoid being in that situation? Okay? So instead of asking how sad are you that, you're, um, that you end up with this car instead of that car, okay, we don't want to measure the utils of driving a Hyundai versus a Lexus. We can't measure those. We can ask is, how much more will you pay to get the Lexus than the Hyundai? And that's a dollar measure of your utils. Okay? That's a compensating variation. How much do you have to be compensated? Okay? So in other words, if I ask, instead of asking you, how sad are you that you couldn't get tickets to a Lady Gaga concert? Okay, maybe that's not a good example because no one's sad about that. But let's say you were. Okay? Uh, let's say I am because my daughter wants to see her. Okay, how sad are you? I ask instead, how much would you pay 
to get the tickets to the Lady Gaga concert. Okay? That's a measure of how sad you were you couldn't get them. Because you'll pay an amount to compensate yourself for the sadness of not getting them. So it's a way of turning utils into dollars. And that leads to the concept that we'll refer to throughout the semester of, uh, that leads to the concept of consumer surplus. Consumer surplus. Consumer surplus measures the benefit that a consumer gets from consuming a good above and beyond what they paid for the good. So it's the benefit of consumption beyond the price. So your consumer surplus, surplus means extra. It's how much you enjoy consuming something above and beyond what you had to pay for it. Okay? In other words, the idea is if you, only, if you have to pay exactly, what you, exactly as much as you enjoy the good, there's no consumer surplus. So let's do an example. So consider my demand to buy a Lady Gaga CD. Okay? I've got to update my examples. You guys don't buy CDs anymore. How many of you have bought a CD in the last year? OK, let me ask another question. This won't be the record, just because I've got to decide how hard a time to give my 16-year-old son. How many of you typically pay when you buy a song? Wow. OK, let me ask you. How many of you typically don't pay when you buy a song? OK. Well, when you get a song, when you download a song. You know what I mean, when you download a song. So the majority don't pay when you download a song. Interesting. OK. Um, all right. So, um, so consider my demand. So I'll update this next year. But for now, we're still 10 years ago. Consider my demand for Lady Gaga CDs. OK, I'm trying to decide whether to buy the marginal CD. OK? And let's say that I, it's worth $15 to me, that I'd be willing to pay $15 for Lady Gaga CD. And let's say the price is $15. Okay? In that case, I, there is no surplus to me. There's nothing extra. I've paid what I was willing to pay. So that's the case of a zero consumer surplus. Consumer surplus is how much extra I got from consuming. I got no extra. It was worth 15, I paid 15, no surplus. Now let's say that the price was $10. Then I got surplus. I got $5 in surplus. I was willing to pay 15. It makes me $15 happier to have this Lady Gaga CD. Okay? But I only had to pay 10 for it, so I've derived some surplus. Okay. Well, how do we know what people's willingness to pay for a good is? The demand curve. That's the definition of the demand curve. The demand curve measures your willingness to pay. So let's go to the second figure. Okay, think about the demand curve for CDs. Okay? There's some demand curve for CDs. What this measures is the utility maximizing choice. Every point in this demand curve represents my utility maximizing choice at that price. So in other words, at a price of, at a, at, at a uh, this is backwards. OK, that should be a 15 on the y-axis and a 5 on the x-axis. Sorry, guys. Should be 15 on the y-axis and a 5 on, and, and a, uh, no. Wait, hold on one second. Time out. At 5, I get no consumer surplus. So at a price, that should be, uh, yeah, this graph's kind of messed up. Let me draw a new one here, OK? OK, so you've got my demand curve for CDs. Okay, you've got the quantity and the price. OK? And I've got, um, and I've got some utility function okay, that delivers this, uh, this um, demand curve. And let's say the way this works, this demand curve for CDs, let's say the way this works is that I am willing to buy one CD Okay, I'm willing to buy, if the price is 20, okay, I'm willing to buy one CD. Okay, so at a price of 20, I'm willing to buy one CD. So if I get that one CD at 20, then basically that's my willingness to pay. It equals a price so there's no consumer surplus. Really sort of imagine it's right next to that y-axis. Now let's say the price falls to, uh, the price falls to 15. Uh, the price, I'm sorry, so the price of 20. Now say the price falls to 15. Okay? At 15, yeah, sorry, that's a 1. Sorry, that's a 1, that's a 20. OK, 
Okay, at twice the 20, I'm willing to buy one. At a price of 15, I'm willing to buy five. I'm willing to buy five CDs. Okay? Now, what is my consumer surplus? Well, let's ask. For the first CD, I got no consumer surplus. But for the second, I was willing to pay. So I'm sorry, so when, when, when the price was 20, I got no consumer surplus. Now let's say the price is 15. So what was I willing to pay for the first CD? 20. So what's my consumer surplus on the first CD? Five. So on that first CD, I got a consumer surplus of five. The second CD, I was willing to pay less because I've got diminishing margin utility. But I was still paying to pay more than $15. So I got some surplus there. Third CD here, et cetera. But on the fifth CD, I derived no surplus because I was willing to pay $15 for that fifth CD, and I paid $15 for that fifth CD. What that means is that all of this is my consumer surplus. Because on every unit, because I paid a fixed price of $15. And for my fifth CD, that delivered no surplus. That was indifferent. But on my first through fourth CDs, that made me very happy because I was willing to pay more than $15 for those. So my consumer surplus is the amount by which I derive utility above what I was willing to pay, uh, uh, above the price. I'm sorry, the amount that I was willing to pay above the price. The amount I'm willing to pay is every point on this curve. So anything I buy that I was willing to pay more than the price for, I derive surplus on. So this becomes my consumer surplus. So basically, consumer surplus is the area under the demand curve above the price. So graphically, consumer surplus is going to be the area under the demand curve above the price. Intuitively, why is that? Intuitively, what's going on is that every unit on, above the price under the demand curve are units which I valued higher than the price. So I get surplus on them. Okay, question? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, the problem is it's sort of, you know, really in some sense you'd want to start at zero. It's really it's the integral of this whole area. The problem is it's discrete. I should have a stepwise curve here, right? I made it discrete, but you really, it's the integral of this area. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, I didn't, what's that? With an upward sloping demand curve, well, we don't, we, we, as I said, we don't believe in given goods. We think they're a, fa they're a fantasy. So with an upward sloping demand curve, uh, how would that work? Uh, so an upward sloping demand curve, then that would say that uh, if the price is here, then you'd get like an infinite consumer, you'd have like an infinite consumer surplus. It wouldn't be well defined wouldn't be well defined. So I don't know how you do that. That's why we don't like upward sloping demand curves. Yeah, question? No? OK, so basically um, what you end up with is this consumer surplus concept, which basically, as pointed out mathematically, is the integral of this area, but we're not going to make you integrate. It's basically this triangle, OK, which is basically all the units above the price uh, for which you're willing, all these for which you're willing to pay more than the price. And you get consumer surplus on every unit you buy up to the point where your willingness to pay equals the price. Okay? And that's our normative measure of welfare. Okay? That's our normative measure of how happy uh, you are. And the key that drives this is diminishing margin utility. That's why we don't like upward sloping demand curves. What drives this is diminishing margin utility. It's that each additional unit I'm willing to pay less and less for. Okay? So I'm going to get less and less surplus off each additional unit I buy. Okay? And that's going to be the key thing, the key intuition you guys have to remember is that last unit that I'm willing to buy at that price, by definition, I get no surplus on. Okay? Because the last unit I'm willing to buy, or I get you know, 0.001 cents of surplus on. Because if I got a lot of surplus, I'd buy one more. Okay? So by definition, the marginal unit is the one where surplus is driven to zero. And units before that are the ones with positive surplus. And that's why an important intuition to have is the amount of surplus you're going to get from a purchase is going to be about how far away from the price point you are. Okay? Those first units are going to be the more surplus, and that's going to dwindle as you get to the actual last unit you buy at that price. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, let me stop there. 
We will come back next time, and we're going to spend the whole lecture talking about wealth for economics. We'll choose producer surplus and talk about how we then think about whether uh, changes are good or bad.